This program was made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. All of us have a personal relationship with stress, but few of us know how it operates within us or understand how the onslaught of the modern world can stress us to the point of death. Fewer still know what we can do about it. But over the last three decades, Stanford University neurobiologist Robert Sapolsky has been advancing our understanding of stress, how it impacts our bodies, and how our social standing can make us more or less susceptible. Is the aggregate bad news? And Most of the time, you can find him teaching and researching in the high-achieving, high-stressed world of brain science. Paper is this huge contrast between glass. But that's only part of his story. For a few weeks every year or so, Sapolsky shifts his lab to a place more than 9,000 miles away on the plains of the Masai Mara Reserve in Kenya, East Africa. Robert Sapolsky first came to Africa over 30 years ago on a hunch. He suspected he could find out more about human stress and disease by looking at non-humans. And he knew just the non-humans. You live in a place like this, you're a baboon, and you only have to spend about three hours a day getting your calories. And if you only have to work three hours a day, you got nine hours of free time every day to devote to making somebody else just miserable. They're not being stressed by lions chasing them all the time. They're being stressed by each other. They're being stressed by social and psychological tumult invented by their own species. They're a perfect model for westernized stress-related disease. To determine just what toll stress was taking on their bodies, Sapolsky wanted to look inside these wild baboons at the cellular level for the very first time. To do this, he would have to take their blood in the most unassuming way. Basically what you're trying to do is anesthetize a baboon uh, without him knowing it's coming. Because you don't want to have any of this anticipatory stress, so you can't just you know, get in your jeep and chase the baboon up and down the field for three hours and finally when he's winded, dart him with an anesthetic. The big advantages of a blowgun are that it's pretty much silent and hasn't a whole lot in the way of moving parts, but the big drawback is it doesn't go very far. So what you spend just a bizarre amount of time doing is trying to figure out how to look nonchalant around a baboon. Got him. Time. Okay, he is wobbling now. Okay. Here he goes. From each baboon blood sample, Robert measured levels of hormones central to the stress response. Well, to make sense of what's happening in your body, you've got these two hormones that are the workhorses of the whole stress response. One of them, we all know, adrenaline, American version, epinephrine. The other is a less known hormone called glucocorticoids. It comes out of the adrenal gland along with adrenaline. And these are the two backbones of the stress response. That stress response and those two hormones are critical to our survival. Because what stress is about is somebody is very intent on eating you or you are very intent on eating somebody and there's an immediate crisis going on. When you run for your life, basics are all that matter. Lungs work overtime to pump mammoth quantities of oxygen into the bloodstream. The heart races to pump that oxygen throughout the body so muscles respond instantly. 
You need your blood pressure up to deliver that energy. You need to turn off anything that's not essential. Growth, reproduction, you know, you're running for your life. This is no time to ovulate. Tissue repair, all that sort of thing. Do it later if there is a later. When the zebra escapes, its stress response shuts down. But human beings can't seem to find their off switch. We turn on the exact same stress response for purely psychological states. Thinking about the ozone layer, the taxes coming up, mortality, 30-year mortgages. We turn on the same stress response and the key difference there is we're not doing it for a real physiological reason and we're doing it non-stop. By not turning off the stress response when reacting to life's traffic jams, we wallow in a corrosive bath of hormones. Even though it's not life or death, we hyperventilate, our hearts pound, muscles tense. Ironically, after a while, the stress response is more damaging than the stressor itself because the stressor is some psychological nonsense that you're falling for. No zebra on earth running for its life would understand why fear of speaking in public would cause you to secrete the same hormones that it's doing at that point to save its life. Stress is the body's way of rising to a challenge, whether the challenge is life-threatening, trivial, or fun. You get the right amount of stress and we call it stimulation. The goal in life isn't to get rid of stress, the goal in life is to have the right type of stress. Because when it's the right type, we love it. We jump out of our seats to experience it. We pay good money to get stressed that way. It tends to be a moderate stressor, where you've got a stressor that's transient. It's not for nothing roller coaster rides are not three weeks long. And most of all, what they're about is you relinquish a little bit of control in a setting that overall feels safe. But in real life, for so many of us primates, including Robert's baboons, control is not an option. So you get some big male who loses a fight and chases a sub-adult who bites an adult female who slaps a juvenile who knocks an infant out of a tree all in 15 seconds. So in so far as a huge component of stress is lack of control, lack of predictability, you're sitting there and you're just watching the zebra and somebody else is having a bad day and it's your rear end that's going to get slashed. So tremendously psychologically stressful for the folks further down on the hierarchy. One of Robert's early revelations was identifying the link between stress and hierarchy in baboons. Some baboon troops are over 100 strong. Like us, they have evolved large brains to navigate the complexities of large societies. Survival here requires a kind of baboon political savvy, with the most cunning and aggressive males gaining top rank and all the perks. Females for the choosing, all the food they can eat, and an endless retinue of willing groomers. Every male knows where he stands in society, who can torture him, whom he can torture, and who in turn the torturee can torture. Well, this sounds like a terrible thing to confess after 30 years, but I don't actually like baboons all that much. I and mean, there's been individual guys over the years who I absolutely love, but they're these schemy, backstabbing, Machiavellian bastards. They're awful to each other. So they're great for my science. I mean, I'm not out here to commune with them. They're perfect for what I study. 22 years ago, at the age of 30, Sapolsky's landmark research earned him the MacArthur Foundation's Genius Fellowship. His early work, measuring stress hormones from extracted blood, led to two remarkable discoveries. A baboon's rank determined the level of stress hormone in his system, 